We have a real treat, um, two speakers. We're going to start with uh, Melissa Cruz Peoples and then uh, bring up uh, Bernard Sequeiros. So Melissa is, has her uh, PhD from Arizona State University and she'll be addressing the uh, Sonoran Desert food traditions from an archaeological uh, perspective and from her uh, work with Native Seed Search and as an educator. And Bernard, who formerly was a board member for Archaeology Southwest and has uh, long been uh, involved with the ed Education Center and the uh, Himdak Ki uh, out at uh, uh, Tapawa on the Tana Autumn Reservation will share Tana Autumn perspectives on desert foodways and lifeways. And I think he's got some real treats to share with you uh, tonight. So let me turn it over to Melissa to start off with things. And so, Melissa, thank you. Thank you, Bill. Thanks. Hi. Good evening, everyone. Um, thanks, Stark Southwest, for um, inviting me to talk about one of my favorite things is food. And so I love to talk about food. <laughs> um, and uh, I, like many of you maybe, didn't grow up in the Sonoran Desert. And so I, my idea of a desert came about as, um, have you heard the term food desert before? It's sort of a term to describe areas, especially urban areas that are very food insecure and don't have access to fresh vegetables and fruits and, and sort of a food desert. And so um, uh, very difficult for people to get access to healthy eating. And so, but the Sonoran Desert is sort of the opposite of a food desert. Um, the Sonoran Desert is, is full of bountiful, amazing uh, foods um, to eat. And so hopefully I can, if you're not familiar, introduce you to some of those foods and, and really encourage you to think about like uh, accessing and, and eating some of these foods. Because um, for thousands of years, people here in the Sonoran Desert have been eating and enjoying these foods um, and then also many introductions of different domesticated crops um, as well, and sort of some unique ways of growing uh, those foods too. And so um, there's really a rich food history um, in the Sonoran Desert. And so uh, that's something to be celebrated and, and enjoy this basically supermarket that the Sonoran Desert provides us. Um, so um, unfortunately this photograph isn't uh, showing um, something from the Sonoran Desert, but it's a really amazing example of um, some amazingly uh, preserved uh, seeds um, and agricultural crops uh, from Wapaki, which is about east of Flagstaff. Um, and so these look like something you might find sort of at the bottom of the bulk bins at Sprouts or something, um, right? Uh, and so these are 800-year-old seeds. These are um, representative of some of the corn, beans, squash varieties grown um, at Wapaki. Um, but why I wanted to show this too is all of these are modern examples of, of agricultural crops that are still being grown today, still thriving um, in many indigenous communities throughout the Southwest. And so when we're talking about past food lifeways, we're really talking about present food lifeways too. Many of these same varieties, many of these same crops, many of the same wild foods um, people ate in the past are things people are still eating and enjoying today. And so um, it's something we all should sort of know about and eat and enjoy as well. And so if we want to see these same foods eaten 800 years from now, right? So we have to enjoy them, um, request them, ask for them, uh, grow them, uh, save seeds from those and ensure that these traditions, not just the food themselves, but the traditions surrounding them too survive um, as we move into the future. Um, archaeologists though generally don't have amazing preserved seed samples like the photo. Uh, this is from Honeybee Village, which is actually in Tucson. Sonoran Desert. This is more what archaeologists rely on to reconstruct what it is people ate um, in the past. And so this is a, as a broken jar and the black mass here is um, some burned squash seeds. Um, in this context, you can't see is some small um, amaranth seeds that probably was in some kind of uh, leather pouch or something. And in this context was also some corn, um, uh, some other uh, seeds and seed remains. So it's essentially someone's um, ancient seed bank. Uh, that happened to burn um, in, in this particular house. And so archaeologists use these clues, these burnt ancient little bits of, of seeds, of food, um, things to reconstruct what it is people were eating. And so you can think about what you had for dinner. How much of what you had would survive a thousand years in the archaeological record? Um, and so much of what we, uh, the food people ate in the past isn't necessarily surviving in the archaeological record. So sometimes things can be uh, sparse or spotty information and data. And, but that's also what's exciting. And I feel like when I joined 
um, Southwestern Archaeology a long time ago now, but um, uh, a lot of our information we've learned over the last 10, 15 years about um, ancient agriculture and what people were growing and, and diversity and things um, is, is a lot of new information. And so we're discovering more and more um, and learning more about uh, ancient food waste. And that's why archaeology is kind of exciting. It's sort of an evolving um, information we have about the past um, too. Um, uh, we also know a lot about what people ate in the past based on uh, other lines of information. The tools associated with processing um, different foods, working different working fields, um, uh, the, the stone hoes, uh, these are wooden digging sticks, um, uh, storage jars um, used to store seeds, different cooking vessels. So it's not just the, the food itself, but how is corn, for example, prepared and, and used. And so it's the cuisine aspect of ancient food waste too that archeologists reconstruct um, based on, on the material record as well. And of course the Southwest, um, much of the Southwest corn was an extremely important uh, food resource and consumed um, a majority of some people's diets throughout, throughout time, but also consumed a majority of people's time as well. And so um, many young, young girls probably spent five to eight hours a day grinding corn in some um, ancient communities. And so these grinding stones and, and the other cultural traditions shared and, and song sung while doing that um, were around these uh, stone grinding grinding stones, which are found um, all over the Southwest. Um, in, in some cases, we also have amazing evidence from where different foods were harvested, procured, or actually grown uh, as well in the Southwest. Um, we have sort of amazing uh, cultural records of this. Um, this may look kind of like a mess, uh, these little grids, but what this is is um, ancient uh, canals, much like the artist reconstruction um, canals, and then within the grid would have been a field, a little plot, um, that the canal water would have fed in and watered that field um, as well. So um, these is quite ancient canals, um, 1200 BC. Um, and then um, canal irrigation really uh, took off in the Phoenix area, right where we are, and we'll talk more about that um, too. And so we have evidence not of just what they were growing by what we find, you know, remnants of different meals, but how they were growing things as well. And so it's pretty amazing um, archaeological record of of how people got food too. Um, so I'm gonna talk about some of those foods and what people actually grew um, and won't uh, bog you down with a lot of dates and, and detail that way, but talk about sort of basically three, uh, four um, um, different phases of, of food um, and different types of food production through time. Um, so as I mentioned, the Sonoran Desert in particular is a food supermarket. This is not a food desert here. <laughs> um, there's an amazing abundance of wild, um, uh, foods and I don't. I'm a plant person, so I didn't focus on all the um, wild animal products too. So jackrabbit, cottontail, um, deer, etc. All sorts of things are out there. So um, when you're, when everything just falls apart, which sounds like it might not be too far off, um, <laughs> um, sometimes we are really well suited. But you got to have the information of how would we actually survive in the Sonoran Desert? Well, there's lots of amazing cultural knowledge of, of how to actually consume and eat. Uh, many of these wild foods um, things but so we'll be better set off even though everyone laughs at us we live in Phoenix when it's 120 but we'll have the last laugh because we have all this amazing uh, food resources if you know how to use them um, out there and so certainly prehistoric people um, continue and today too continue to um, uh, use uh, these wild resources and, and wild foods many of which are extremely nutritious foods and kind of something in the Sonoran Desert is available all the time as well. So throughout the whole calendar year there's something um, in the wild foods that can be harvested and processed as well. Um, uh, but uh, not only the Sonoran Desert provides a lot, it's kind of weird to think about in the desert that people were agricultural people, um, that people actually grew food when we we're always talking about water shortage and, and issues, but just like agriculture today is such a big economy in Arizona as it was in the prehistoric past, um, starting about 4,000 years ago. So we've had um, an introduction of, of uh, the first wave of domesticated crops, so things that actually would be planted, um, grown, harvested, uh, the food, saved the seeds, planted the next year, tended um, um, crops. And so many of these actually come outside of the Southwest, outside of Arizona, from Mesoamerica, um, where corn, for example, was domesticated some 8,000 years ago starting. It's a long process to move, and we'll talk about that 
um, and then uh, made its way via people, via seed sharing um, and movement um, into the Southwest. And um, uh, what you may know and think about the three sisters, corn, beans, squash, um, as some of these staples, and um, some other things like gourds, um, which aren't necessarily directly eaten, but used um, to make all sorts of amazing um, containers, water canteens, musical instruments, rattles, etc. So a lot of things that people grew are not always consumed and eaten, but have other um, purposes or other reasons why people would grow, grow those foods. Um, we'll talk more about tepary beans, which has anyone tried tepary beans? Have them? Oh, good. That's pretty good for a lot of people. So if you haven't, it's something you need to make a little note, seek it out, and, and try some. So this is the bean of the Southwest, the bean of, of Arizona, Southern Arizona and the Sonoran Desert specifically. Um, so it is one of the most drought tolerant beans in the world. Um, most crops, and as Bernard and I were just joking earlier, you think if you want to grow something, you just give it lots and lots of water and it's going to thrive. Well, many of these crops have 4,000 years of adaption to the desert conditions. And so tepary bean um, is one of those two. The more water you give it, the less it will grow, the, less, the fewer beans it will produce. And so um, it's extremely drought tolerant um, um, and arid adapted. Um, extremely high in protein and, and iron and a really like amazing bean. Um, it's our little secret here in Arizona, but uh, is, is something you should seek out to enjoy. And so um, over time, oops. oh, I didn't talk about corn, which is kind of a huge uh, major important part. And we have all these amazing um, really master plant breeders um, who lived in, in what is now modern Mexico um, today, starting thousands of years ago, this process of changing this tiny little grain um, known as teosinte into what we know today as corn, which is a major um, agricultural crop around the world. Um, and so those master plant breeders uh, made selections and decisions to change corn from this tiny little ear um, of corn, as you see the penny here for scale, um, with a very hard outer seed coat, coat on that into what you know as corn today. And, and corn is not just corn on the cob sweet corn. There are literally millions of different types of corn and millions of different ways to cook corn and colors, um, shapes, and different textures and densities of those kernels. And so those are all adapted to different environmental conditions, and, um, but also different culinary traditions and how you actually consume that corn. And so um, when corn arrived in the Southwest, it was a domesticated. We did not have teosinte um, in the Southwest. Uh, uh, being grown. It sort of, when it arrived, it was corn, but not necessarily the corn you think of. Um, the corn was quite small. It was still very hard. It was be classified as a popcorn, um, so not something you can eat it green corn on the cob, but would be much starchier um, than you're used to as like a sweet corn um, developed. And so this is a series of, of samples of corn found um, in New Mexico, but it shows this progression and change in corn over time of moving from these kind of pinky sized ears of corn with very tiny kernels to what um, more uh, like a size we think of today. And then also transitioning to a different type of corn um, with these much fatter kernels um, that is more of a flour corn that's much easier to grind. If you've ever had popcorn, it's very hard. So you can imagine grinding that into flour would be difficult where a flour corn is much softer. So you can grind it into flour and offers a whole different culinary traditions of how you'd consume, eat that corn. Now you can, and it's quite delicious, pop popcorn, and much as probably ancient peoples did, and then grind the pop popcorn. It's, it's delicious and very light and fluffy in anything that you prepare with pop popcorn. Um, and so uh, this ancient corn is known as uh, chapalote type corn, very dark, hard kernel popcorn. And we still have chapalote corn today. Um, as well. So, so these traditions of 4,000 years of chapalote corn has survived that time. It's gotten bigger and changed some, but it's quite uh, this uh, longevity and culinary um, usage of, of chapalote has continued. Um, so as people relied more and more on actually planting, saving seeds, and, and tending agricultural crops, we get much more diversity of different types of things. And then also another uh, second wave of introductions uh, of additional crops. Um, and these are much more intensively farmed um, crops. So still corn, beans, and squash, we're getting additional types of squash. So not just pumpkins and sort of what you know is maybe summer squash, um, but different kusha squashes and butternuts and, and things. And then um, 
Uh, and then we also get some crops that maybe are different, that aren't just consumed or grown to be consumed and for calories, like cotton. Um, and then uh, these are jack beans, um, which have a different, uh, more ceremonial or medicinal use to them than pintos and black beans and things and peppers. And so uh, diversity and, and why people are investing in growing different stuff too. And so cotton, of course, is used to make um, textiles and so, uh, um, and could then sort of be used as a trade item throughout the Southwest uh, as well. Um, oh, and then I didn't mention, but there's also some other grains. Um, maybe you're not familiar or heard of uh, panic grass or little barley. Um, um, two uh, are sort of local wild foods that become changes to the actual seed as people harvest and select um, for different properties of those seeds and locally domesticate uh, those crops too, which um, even these little tiny seeds are important grain crops and offer and so provide a whole balanced nutrition um, as well. So panic grass in particular is really high in lysine, um, which is a, a, a nutrient that's lacking in corn. And so you need a lysine in your, in your diet. Uh, otherwise, um, you may have heard of pellagra is sort of disease. If you're relying too much on corn, you sort of get this anemia and like um, terrible things can happen. So, um, you, so you can tell your children you can't just eat Cheetos. It's not going to work. You have to eat um, lots of different, different foods uh, uh, to be healthy. Um, and so, but here in what is Phoenix or the Sonoran Desert, really the corn, beans, squash, and cotton is sort of the main um, investment in these ancient crops. And uh, a lot of the tepary beans being so arid, um, uh, those definitely diversify um, as we move through time and, and uh, are relied upon. And it's typically a dried, um, a dried bean is how tepary beans are consumed. Um, and then the kusha type squashes, which may seem unfamiliar. Sometimes you find them at Halloween in like the decorative squash bins, you know, at the grocery store, but they're delicious, a very light um, flavored squash, soft, not hard like a butternut. Um, but these you can't, if you're interested in gardening and growing, you can't kill these. They love the heat. They survive on little water. Again, those traditions of, of things that have been grown here for thousands of years have the knowledge of how to grow in our heat and, and water stressed um, climate. Um, and then uh, how people were growing these crops here in the, the Phoenix area is quite amazing um, too. So uh, maybe you've heard that Phoenix is known as the land of the stone hoe. Back when people, were, Europeans were first uh, settling the, the um, area, uh, people would find stone hoes digging um, implements uh, throughout everywhere. And that's the result of that people literally farmed everywhere in what we know of as, as modern uh, Phoenix. And so this map isn't familiar to orient yourself. There's South Mountain towards the bottom and the Salt River going through. We're actually where the star is um, in the map right now, um, kind of sandwiched between the ancient village known as Las Capas. All these squares are, are um, villages, um, Las Capas and I think Casa Buena maybe Leslie knows, um, to the east of us. So we're kind of smack in between these two big villages. And then what looks like arteries running through the city are actually ancient canals, um, canal systems that would have delivered water to agricultural fields. So where we are, if we would have um, been able to view this landscape 2000 years ago, would have been um, farm fields um, everywhere, uh, coming off and being fed by these um, water canals. Um, and so um, this entire landscape we know as Phoenix would be an agricultural landscape um, and full of farm fields, much like this artist reconstruction uh, where these crops were grown. And then some of the wild foods still kind of in some of these undisturbed areas and then certainly further afield um, around the density of population and density of, of farmland that um, has existed. And these canals to get water, so this is showing our city grid. So you could Google this later and see where your house is and what canals maybe you're near. Um, to get water from the Salt River, we're way up here, right? And so many of you may have driven over Grand Canal. If you came up Camelback or when you leave, um, you'll drive over Grand Canal. That is um, this canal right here. Um, and so uh, it's in the same location today as it was um, in the ancient past about 2,000 years ago too. And so. Um, you can imagine all the, the abundance that would have been growing these areas. And so these are quite large systems to bring water all the way from where the airport is, essentially, 
um, in, into this part of Phoenix. And so um, quite uh, master engineers to make this work. And so really um, pretty uh, genius, actually, um, to build and design this. So, um, um, so this is kind of going through uh, the very uh, indigenous native foods that existed in the Southwest. Um, but this thing happened in um, the late 1492, right? So the world sort of changed. And we have um, a new wave of introduction of all of these crops and foods uh, that came with Spanish colonization of the Southwest. Um, and as uh, Spaniards colonized Mexico too, movement of population and people, and what moves with people is their food and their traditions um, with food and those seeds as well. And so many of those seeds traveled faster than the people did too, as people traded things up. So. Um, when the Spaniards arrived in the northern pueblos, for example, they were already growing cantaloupes um, and watermelons and things um, before they were specifically colonized too. So um, many of those crops come from Africa originally, but they grow much like squash and cowpeas and fava beans and things are of um, Middle Eastern uh, origin, but they grow just like beans. And so they're very easily adopted into uh, traditional food uh, life ways too. And so, um, relatively new introduction, I guess, but have been around for 400 plus years um, in the Southwest. And so certainly developing unique um, varieties and, and, and those seeds are very adapted to um, growing. And so we see this kind of diversity in, in food crops. Um, and uh, wheat is another one, especially when um, uh, the missionaries moved into the area to be able to make proper communion wafer. You can't do that with corn. You have to do that with wheat. And so um, wheat comes in and it's an uh, interesting balance of growing wheat in the winter and corn in the summer summer months. And so um, these other foods were adopted in some cases and, and become part of the traditional food ways. Um, and so then it also introduces new material culture and, and um, other uh, ways of living and other ways of farming um, too. And then we get some of the, the fruits and, and stone fruits and other things and um, at this time. So, um, but what I want to point out before we pass off to Bernard to talk about some other things is, is kind of to segue into what he's talking about. Many of these ancient foods um, um, aren't just ancient, they're living and thriving today. And so many uh, of these traditional life ways are still being practiced and still being consumed. And so um, after the talk, you're welcome to explore some of these uh, traditional foods and wild foods and things that are up here. Um, and these are all things you can find um, if you seek them out. Um, in different ways that you can actually try yourself. Um, try some tepary beans and try some um, different cactus preparations and mesquite pods and things that um, are, have been consumed in this land for thousands of years. And so um, we're not just talking about past food ways. These are very much present and hopefully into the future uh, food ways here in our region. So thank you. Um, uh, we'll take questions at the end, I think, right, Bill? So I do want to pass off to Bernard so he can tell us a little more about these foods. Thank you. We're going to start with a blessing song. Oh, I love that. 
So the young lady with the beautiful voice is my wife, Regina, and uh, she just sang a blessing song for us about this mountain here, which is very sacred in autumn uh, Himadag or autumn culture. We call it Wau Kiwork. Uh, on the maps, if you look at the maps of Arizona, it'll say Babo Kiwari. Babo Kiwari is really the Spanish translation of our word for this mountain, which is Wau Kiwork. So I'd like to begin first by just saying that um, Several years ago, we were um, in a session with a, a group of our elders, and we were um, reviewing the documents, uh, the translated documents of the Spanish uh, who came in contact with our ancestors in the 1600s. And we talked about that exchange of cultures that, that went on between the Spanish and our ancestors. And um, we talked about the many foods that were available out in the desert. And uh, my uncle, who was with the group, whom I respect as a, a knowledgeable elder, he, uh, he was kind of kidding, but he was telling the truth when he said, Bernard, when I look out in the desert, I see my grocery store. Because anything I ever need to find to eat, anything I need to eat can be found in the desert. And he said, and when I look out in the desert, I also see my drug store because there are many medicinal uses of many of the plants that are found on our lands. And then he also said, when I look out in the desert, I see my hardware store, because anything we need to build our homes or other things were found in the desert. So I wanted to start with that and just to show you a few of the examples of many of the plants that played a major role in our survival as a people. And we start with this particular plant that we call a hasha. Sawaro. This plant is so significant that in our creation story, there is a story that explains how the first Hashan came to be on our lands and how it's now spread across our lands. But the Hashan provides fruit in the uh, early summer, maybe real late spring. Today, we still harvest this food. Uh, we process it and we make syrups and we make jams. But we also take a portion of our syrup and we ferment it and we use it during our prayer for rain ceremony. Uh, we are a desert people, so rain is extremely important to us and our plants and our animals. And so our sacred ceremony is our prayer for rain and we use a fermented drink from the fruit of saguaro in this ceremony. This plant also provides building materials. In fact, the, at the time we go to collect the fruit of the saguaro is when we begin our new year, because this is right at the beginning of the monsoon seasons. Once the monsoon arrives, uh, the land is uh, replenished, the animals are happy, the plants are happy, the people are happy, and this is how we start our new year. So the hashin is a very important plant in our culture. Also, we have, uh, during the springtime, we have a very short window of time to, to pick this particular fruit off of the choya. We call that fruit uh, chordim. And chordim is a very healthy source of food. In fact, if a person should eat chordim on a fairly regular basis, this food can help, help uh, control the sugars in a person's system. And so it's a very healthy food, just like many cacti uh, foods are. And so the chordim, uh, is collected during, again, during the spring, before they flower. Once they flower, they're no longer good to eat. And so because we, we as all of them have a fairly high rate of diabetes in our system, we see a lot of families going out during the springtime to collect as much as they can during, during the time that they're ready to be harvested. Another uh, source of food that our, 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 our lands provide are these beans that grow on the mesquite tree. We call them wehok. Uh, as children, or as young people, we had a favorite watering hole, water hole, which is really a cattle pond uh, by the mountainside that we used to go to to swim. And all along this cattle pond were these large mesquite trees 
that would produce these mesquite beans. And so as we swam and we got hungry, we would get out of the water and pick beans and eat them raw, eat them raw, and they're very sweet. Our ancestors used to take these beans and pound them and grind them up in, in, in what do you call these, mortars? Yeah, mortars. And so these are, you find these all over the desert. Uh, you find, find them up in the mountains where people would sit and grind mesquite beans or corn or other things. But they would grind this mesquite bean into flour and use that flour to make gruel or to make cakes and other things. And so it's a very important plant. Not only does it provide food, but it also pr provides the material that we need for our fences, for our homes, and other things. These are one of those examples of what my uncle said was, when I look out in the desert, I see my hardware store because there were many mesquite trees out there that could be, uh, that could be used for various reasons. Also, the mesquite tree provides a sap, a sap that we could, uh, when we were kids, we used to collect them, and it's, 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 it's kind of sweet, it's not real sweet, but it's got a sweet taste, and they were like, um, gumdrops, I guess, and we would pop, we would pick them, pick them off the trees and pop them in our mouth, and, and there was a good source of food. Also, we find that um, the black sap of the mesquite tree, we're told that women would, in the past, would take this black sap and put it in their hair to keep their hair dark <laughs> or black. So I don't think anyone does that anymore, but the, we, we, there's many uses for many of these plants that we find you know, on our lands. We have, in, in the summertime, we have uh, what we call uh, iipai, or the tuna, I think the Spanish call them, the fruit of the prickly pear, which again is very sweet. And as children, you know, when I think about it, I think as children, we forged the land. We were out all the time eating those things that were very good for us. And the jordan, I mean the iipai, is a source of food that was very good. And there's different, different species of jordan and some are a little sweeter than others but so but you need to know what type to pick uh, and so these these foods are are very special in our culture and uh, in fact when a person passes on into the next life they say that that person has gone to eat jo or eat ipai he's gone to a place where there's a lot of ipai and so this is again a very important plant in our culture. Uh, we have the uh, organ pipe, which grows to the southern part of our lands. We call this the chuchuis. And the chuchuis also grows uh, a fruit much like the saguaro fruit. Uh, they're a little thornier and a little bigger. And so, but those are collected also and used in the very same way that the, the um, saguaro fruit is used. And so the desert is all providing Many years ago, I got involved with Bill Dolis and the Center for Desert Archaeology at the time, and we were invited, or we were asked to participate in a, a, cult, a, a project that brought elders to the San Pedro River Valley to um, try to reconnect with that area because we had moved away from the area many, many years ago. And so we took a group of elders along and we were visiting archaeological sites and the two, there were two brothers that had gone with us and at one point when we were in, a, in at an ar ar archaeological site these two brothers were standing in this in this area and they were kind of laughing and talking to one another so I went over and asked them what they were what they were looking at and they were looking at what we call a chuamakut or a roasting pit where our elders used to roast, um, or our ancestors roasted agave. And they started telling us about how when they were young, uh, their community, their village, would go up into the mountains uh, near where, where their village was located. And the whole community would go, and everybody had different jobs. Men would go up, and they would harvest the agave. Uh, they, as young boys, were responsible for going out to collect as much firewood as they could to place in these roasting pits that other men had, had, were preparing. And so when they told us about this, we, um, we asked them to show us where, where they roasted their agave. And so we went out to the sites on, on our lands now and saw the sites where they had the uh, roasting pits. And so I work for the Tohono O'odham Nation's Culture Center Museum. And we decided at one time that we were going to reintroduce 
uh, this, this activity of harvesting agave and roasting them in a very traditional way. And so with the help of several young men from our, our nation, we actually, and, and these two elders who were our, who were our teachers, we went out and, and harvested the agave, came back and, and dug the roasting pits and lined them with rocks, just like our ancestors, ancestors would have done. We filled it up with mesquite wood and burned it, and it, as, as it made a thick bed of coals, we were able to put the agave on it and cover it, over, cover it up with dirt and left it for two days. And after the second day, we, we took them out and they were delicious. They were delicious. And so we had an, agar we had an agave tasting event at the museum inviting tribal members to come and taste a sample this agave. But what we did was we had, we had the young men that helped us, we had them talk about their experience in harvesting and learning this process. And every one of them felt very grateful that they were part of that group because they had learned something that was a part of our way of life in the past. They had learned something that they said that they would teach to their children as, as time went on. So it was a very important and exciting event that we had activity. Many plants on our lands. This is the creosote, or we call shrugge. It's a medicine plant. Uh, my wife oftentimes will burn shrugge uh, to bless our home. When I come in from work sometimes, I smell the smell of the creosote smoke, and it, 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 it tells me that my wife has purified our home or blessed our home or other things. But it's also a good medicine plant. They say that if you, if you come home and you're tired and your feet are achy and sore, uh, boil some of this and soak your feet in it, and, and, and you'll be soothed. And, and, and So it's a very important plant as well. There's a, a plant that grows on our lands, which most of the time looks like a dry stick in the desert. They're very hard to find. They're very easy to find when they're blossoming because they have a very sweet smell and they have this beautiful flower that blossoms one day a year. One day a year. And so the autumn called this plant ho'ok wa'o. Uh, Wa'o is a tongue made out of sawar ribs that you use to pick uh, the, the, the different types of fruits off of the different types of plants because most of the fruits are very thorny, right? So you don't want to pick them with your bare hands. So you use this uh, tongue made out of sawar ribs. And so, so our ancestors called this hawk wa'o. Uh, wa'o. Hawk is our word for a witch woman. And there's a story in our creation story that talks about a witch woman that terrorized our lands. And it's, it's a long story, so we're not going to be able to share it with you now. But the, the, this plant is connected to that story of hawk, ox, so they call it hawk, wa'o. The brittle bush also, you can see the, on the branches, you see the little pods or the little drops of sap that, that, that come out on them, those, those little saps we would collect and, and chew them as chewing gum. Uh, so they were, they were another, another source of food out in the desert for us. And when we were kids, it tasted like spearmint. I tried it a couple of years ago and it didn't taste like spearmint. <laughs> I must have lost my taste for this uh, sap, but it's, it's, a good, it's also a good medicine plant. We're told by our elders that it can be used to help cleanse your, your system uh, if, if, if it's needed. There are many plants out there that our ancestors used for various reasons, for purposes, to make baskets, utilitarian baskets. And so uh, we, have, uh, we have what we call a, a moho or bear grass which is used, which is stripped and used as the center or the core of the basket. So it's used for basket material. The takui or the yaka is used to coil around the moha to, to make those baskets. And so it's also good, a good source of soap for washing your hair. And so this plant also 
is found in the high deserts. We don't, we don't have much of it on where we live, but in areas where our, other, our ancestors lived in the high deserts, we find the, the moha and the takwi that grow there. Just other little sources of food that, that we had growing up. As I said, we foraged the desert. And so when the okatia or the murok uh, flowers were blossoming, we would walk along and we would pull a branch down and we would pull a flower off of the, the, the pods there or the little flower there and we'd suck on it. It was very sweet. We'd suck the nectar off of these flowers so that provided a, a sweet taste. But we also use it to build many things. As you can see we have fencing. We use the material for fencing. And they're actually, these are actually live fences because when you build a fence, you dig a small hole about four or five inches deep and you, and you plant those cuttings in the ground as you tie them to the post and eventually they'll grow. They'll begin to grow, they'll leaf up and so you'll have a live plant and they'll be, you need to trim them all the time though because they grow, they grow very fast. But they're, they're a good source of uh, food and uh, fencing material. Um, I wanted to say, that this was just a sampling of many of the plants that grow on our land that are very, a very important part of our himaduk, our culture. Years ago, we had, well, it wasn't too many years ago, 10 years ago, I say, we had a, um, in a very small village in the far western regions of our nation, our leadership at the time called for a summit. Uh, we had had several summits that year. We had a housing summit, we had a health summit, we had um, education summit, leadership summit. The purpose for this summit that was called for was to bring all of them together, bring the people together to talk about our way of life, our culture. And so many people gathered and there was a lot of talk about our, our way of life being our language. In fact, that was, that was the opening discussion and how important our language was and how we needed to keep it alive and keep it strong. Then, then there was a lot of talk about our ceremonies, our ceremonies that connected us to one another and to our environment. And those things were very important. Then those core values that were taught by the Creator deep respect, uh, industri industriousness, uh, uh, sharing, um, knowing your family, all these things were very important. So all of these things were discussed. As things began to wind down, there was an elder woman who finally stood up. She, she had something she wanted to say, and she stood up and she started pounding on the table to catch everybody's attention. And when everybody stopped to listen, she, oh, she spoke very eloquently in our language. She says, all of these things that we talked about today are true. All of these things are part of who we are. Our language, our values, our, our, our ceremonies, all of these things are important. But whatever you do, don't you dare forget our foods. Our foods are very much a part of our way of life too. And she said, look out there in the desert. And she started naming the saguaro, the mesquite, the prickly pears, the choyas, all these plants. And she said, those plants out there in the desert, they're very strong. They have survived the hottest day in the summer, and they're still there. They've survived the coldest night in the winter, and they're still there. They've survived the longest period without rain, and they're still there. They're there because they're strong. And she said, we, as all of them, used to be that strong. We were a strong people because we would go out there and we would collect the foods from these plants. And when we ate the foods from those plants, the strength from those plants entered our bodies and became our strength. But she said, but because we no longer do these things, we have become a sick people. So it's very important for us to recognize the fact that many of these plants were very much a part of our way of life. They were part of our culture. They were what, they were what kept us strong and kept us healthy. And then later on when the Spanish came, as, as Melissa mentioned, the Spanish came and introduced new plants, uh, new sources of food. And uh, we, 
we, we, har we planted the desert. Uh, those people, those relatives of ours that lived along the rivers were primarily farmers, but people that lived in the desert were also farmers. And so, uh, as, with, as, with, as with many things, we have songs and we have stories that connect us to these plants, to, these, to our environment. And I'm gonna ask my wife to sing a song that she sings to you every time I go out and do a little planting in my garden because I can't sing worth a darn. So, <laughs> so my wife comes in and she sings for me and sings to these plants and, and helps them to grow, okay? Thank you. So these again are just examples, as, as Melissa mentioned earlier, of many of the plants that we grow in our, in our fields and in our gardens. Uh, again, we were farmers of the desert. Uh, and so um, these plants that were introduced were, were plants such as the figs. Uh, we have a fig tree in our backyard and uh, my grand, one of our granddaughters loves to come to our house when the figs are ripe. And she always asked for a fig. And so uh, I told her, 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 her um, father, so you dig me a hole, dig a hole near your, your garden and I'll, and I'll bring you a tree so you can plant it for your daughter. And so we'll, he's yet to dig a hole though, so <laughs> we'll, we'll get to it sometime, okay? Uh, pomegranates also, we have a pomegranate plant in our tree that um, actually my daughter bought and, and, and never put it in the ground and was gonna throw it out because it looked like it was dead. I took it home, started watering and it greened up and so we put it in the ground and it started to grow so and it started to provide fruit. So many of these plants traditionally, not in the not too distant past, most families would have fig trees and pomegranate trees and peach trees and these are all uh, plants that were introduced by the Spanish when they, when they came in contact with our ancestors. Um, Animals that we hunted uh, in, the, in the area to provide meat. Uh, I was talking to one of our elders uh, one time and she says, Bernard, when we were growing up, we rarely ate meat. We ate what we collected from the desert or what we harvested from the desert or what we harvested from our fields. The only time we ate meat was when some hunter was, was fortunate to, to kill an animal and he would share this meat with us. And she says, but today our children have to eat meat three times a day. In the morning they want ham or bacon with their eggs or in the, at noon they want a hamburger or a ham sandwich and in the evening they want a steak or says, and it's really fatty meat. The meat that we have today is really fatty. And she says, no wonder we're in the shape that we're in today. You know, but traditionally we rarely ate meat and we ate game that was very, very lean lean meat, and so this, this is a source of some of our, our meats. The white-tailed deer, the mule deer, I'm trying to rush through this, the bighorn sheep. Uh, and then animals in our stories. Again, because we're very connected to our lands and those things that are in our lands, we have many stories about plants, about animals. You know, there's a time, there was a, a, st a story in our creation that talks about a time when we were able to communicate with all the plants and the animals. 
that we understood one another or we understood them very well. We were very connected to these things and so there were stories. I told Bill I wanted to share this one story with you that I shared at another session one time about the quail, the kakaichu, and the ban, which is the coyote. And the title of this story is Matukakaichu Sijukaichu Ban, which translates to mean when the quail played a, played a trick on the coyote. And the story talks about a time when there was a covey of quail walking through the desert. And all of a sudden they stopped and they were all looking over in the shade of a saguaro, there was a coyote fast asleep. And so they started talking to one another and they were saying, is he the one that's been chasing us? Is he the one that's always trying to eat us? And they all agreed, they said, yeah, I think he's the one. And so they came together and they decided to play a trick on him. So they very, very carefully, several of them walked over to where he was asleep and they picked up his tail to expose his rear end. When they did that, several other quail came with very sharp rocks and they cut his butt and they took fat from his butt and took it away. When they finished that, other quail came and they had um, uh, yucca fiber strips and they took those and they sewed his butt back up. But before they finished, they took some pebbles, some rocks to fill that void that was made from where they took his fat. They sewed him up and then they all flew away. When the coyote woke up, he stretched and he was hungry. He, he says, I'm really hungry. I need, I need to find something to eat. So he started walking across the desert. All of a sudden, he smelled somebody cooking fat. And he, thought, he followed his nose to a little ravine there. And in this ravine, there was these quail sitting around roasting fat. And the coyote went over there and says, my little brothers, what's that that you're cooking? And the quail said, it's fat that we, we bought over behind the mountain. We traded some baskets for it. So the coyote says, can I have some? And the quail said, sure. So they gave him a piece and he ate it up. He says, can I have another piece? Sure. So they gave him another piece and they kept giving him a piece. Pretty soon he ate up all the fat that they were cooking. And the coyote said, this was good. Where did you get it? And the quail said, over behind the mountains, we traded some baskets for it. So he said, I'm going to go get some more. So he started running off. As he ran off, the quail started laughing. He said, oh, there goes that coyote. He ate his own butt fat and he's going to get some more. <laughs> and the coyote stopped and he says, what? What did you say? Over behind the mountains, we traded some baskets for it. So he ran off again. And the, the quail just cracked up and they were rolling in the sand and they were saying, ah, that crazy coyote ate his own butt fat and he's going to get some more. And the coyote stopped again. I said, what? What did you say? Over behind the mountains, we traded some baskets for it. Just then there was a little cottontail rabbit uh, walking while running by and he stopped and he wanted to befriend the coyote. So he said, I'll tell you what they said. They said, you ate your own butt fat, and you're going to get some more. So the coyote got really up. He finally, finally made sense what was going on. So he ran after those coyotes, I mean those quail. He said, just for that, I'm going to eat you, every one of you. And he started chasing them across the desert. And the quail would fly, and there was a large gopher hole. And the quail, one by one, flew down in that hole to get away from the coyote. The last quail to fly into that hole picked up a, a, a piece of choya, very thorny choya, and he took it down the hole with him. And down in the hole, the quail plucked one feather from each of their tails and they stuck it in that choya to make it look like one of them. So when the coyote got there, he started digging and he dug, he dug and he dug and he, he was able to get a, one of the quail and he pulled it out and he says, 
Are you the one that said this about me? If you are, I'm going to eat you right now. And that coyote said, it wasn't me. It wasn't me. It was the one down in the hole. He said that about you. So he threw that quail out and he flew away and he got down. He started digging again. Picked out another quail. Said, are you the one that said this about me? And that quail said, no, the one down in the hole, he's the one that said that about you. So he kept doing that, he kept doing that till he got this last quail. And he said, are you the one that said this about me? And that quail didn't say a thing. So he said, you must be the one, just for that, I'm going to eat you. And he took a big bite. And, Whoa, he, got, he started screaming because he had thorns all over his mouth. And that was how the quail played a trick on that coyote. So thank you very much for your time. Uh, Th thank you, Bernard. That's my favorite story. I love it. <laughs> <laughs> so we're going to have an opportunity for questions, and, and uh, Melissa will turn her microphone up, back on, and we can uh, get a little bit more information from these folks. Uh, this is what I had asked before about the saya, S-A-I-Y-A. It's a flower that's uh, supposed to grow around Tucson, and they're, I, I don't think that they're very populous but you're supposed to be able to eat all of it, pretty much. I, um, I was peeking at Wendy over here, because I wasn't familiar. I've heard that word, but I don't know much about it, and so, and, and Wendy was shaking her head. So Wendy, do you mind answering no. more, or? Sorry, this is Wendy Hodgson, everyone, who knows a lot more about plants than I. <laughs> Not really. Uh, that's Saya, and that's Amaruxia palmatifida, and uh, it's a, a really cool plant. It's southern Arizona into throughout much of Mexico, um, and e you're right, every single part of that plant is edible. It has a tuber-like root that you can uh, roast or bake or eat raw, and I've eaten it raw, and it's actually pretty good, a little gritty, <laughs> but, uh, and then you can eat the flowers, you can eat the young seeds, the young fruits, and the mature seeds too. And there's a rare species that's in southern Arizona and in Sonora, uh, it's quite rare, it's a different species, but that was also used too. It's one of the most beautiful plants too in the desert. We tried growing it at the garden, at the Desert Botanical Garden, and it had good success. And uh, it, it is one, I think, that is, as we say, worthy of cultivation. You know, it's a very attractive plant. You know. Well, the joy of getting people like Melissa and Bernard together in the same room, again, this trajectory of literally millennia that we have here of uh, food traditions, the more that we're finding out that Irrigation goes back 3,000, 3,500 years, the history of, of crops, and putting that into the context of everything from, the, Regina, thank you for the story, the uh, songs and, and uh, uh, blessing that you shared with us, and Bernard, your uh, sharing of the knowledge that uh, the Tan Autumn have, and. I love that story. I've heard it before, and I look forward to hearing it again. So um, we're going to be back on March 5th, and the topic then will be, again, what's southwest of the Phoenix area along the Gila River. Uh, Aaron Wright of Archaeology Southwest will be speaking then. And it's a joy to drive up here and, and uh, share this these speakers and uh, this kind of time with, with the audience. So thanks, Melissa, and thank you, Bernard.